Asia Cultural Center. And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 2 p.m. Up next, Tara Verde. From the Amazon basin, from the magnificent redwoods of California to the icy majesty of the Arctic, life on Earth faces an unprecedented threat from careless development. Join Terra Verde over lunch today to find out about the unfolding future of the planet. Hello and welcome to Terra Verde, a weekly environmental radio show on KPFA, KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno. My name is Michelle, your host. Well, this weekend, the Green Festival is coming back to San Francisco. It's a weekend of talks, workshops, and of course, lots of exhibitors all promoting a greener economy. And so today on Terra Verde, we'll be talking about greening the economy, how people have used their consumer power to change corporate behaviors, to support sustainable livelihoods, and create alternatives to the dig, burn, dump economy that we live in today. But advocates to green the economy also face pitfalls as well, from corporate greenwashing to maybe a mistaken notion that we can just buy our way out of the sustainability problem. So a lot to talk about. And with us on the show today, we have Kevin Donahue, who's co-founder of Global Exchange, and Liz O'Connell, Fair Labor Campaigns Director for Green America. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having us on. Thank you. So... GreenFest was started 12 years ago as a collaboration between Global Exchange and Green America, two campaign organizations that have really worked for a long time on issues such as fair trade and consumer, I mean, sorry, uh, corporate accountability. So, um, Kevin, I wanted to start with you at Global Exchange. What was your original intention when your two organizations decided to start GreenFest? Well, it was actually 13 years ago, and I apologize if there's any background noise because it's a little bit chaotic here, but... Um, you know, we were participating in all the World Bank IMF protests, the WTO protests up in Seattle, and the anti-war protests. And, you know, the left has gotten really good at what we're against and saying no. And I was thinking, you know, maybe we should develop a yes. And I started to see that there was this whole green economy developing. And, look, I want to be clear from the outset. We're anti-imperialist. We're anti-capitalist. We're anti-corporate power. The notion that you can buy your way into sustainability or something, that, that, you know, that, that just doesn't fly. There's going to be companies that maybe say they're doing more than they really are, whatever, the greenwashing. And, yeah, we're enemies of greenwashing. We want to get rid of that kind of stuff. We want to set high standards. And that actually creates a problem because if you set really high standards, how are you going to sell enough booth space to make the make the show fly, we want it to be a mass event with nobody kept out. So the gate money, the admission price is really low. Well, you can you actually can't make money then on an event. You're going to lose a lot of money unless you get a lot of exhibitors. So it's a struggle because these big venues you gotta you gotta have big indoor venues because people are showing their products and their literature you can't do it outside and these big venues have a built-in flaw and that is that they're empty most of the time they're not generating any revenue but they are generating cost and they prorate the inefficiency of their business model onto you renting it for a few days so it's really tough. And what it comes down to in each city is how mature is the green economy network in that city. So San Francisco is the best of all our green festivals. And no offense to anybody, but Washington, D.C. is probably the weakest because it's not that big a well-developed green economy. And I think... The left in general needs to get out of this powerlessness thing of like, oh, we're screwed. The Republicans have the Senate and all. Most Americans didn't even vote in the last election. So we don't know that there's any landslides that are right or anything like that. And I think you see lots of examples of the cult of powerlessness. And that's part of what we're trying to fight is to say, look, we've got all the tools we need. It's mainly courage that we're lacking and social mobilization, getting enough people out in the street. 
Yeah, so um, I think that you've actually um, opened the door to a lot of different things. I want to turn it over to you, Liz O'Connell, from, from Green America. I mean, what's your what's your take? Um, on growing the green economy and the role that we can, the, that consumers can play, um, I'm I'm still positive and hopeful. I mean, Kevin's right. There is this sort of feeling after the election, like we're doomed. We're feeling somewhat deflated about our future. But um, there's so much we can do outside of the political system. And as consumers, uh, we have a, a huge role. The power of the dollars that we spend, but also our voice, um, is powerful. And I'd say more powerful than ever because of the tools that we have online to um, take our our concerns and our wishes um, to any corporation. Right. And so um, real quick from um, Co-op America's, Co-op America's perspective, I mean, back to the question of what was the original vision that, uh, sorry, Green America actually it was Co-op America at the time, Green America brought to creating this Green Fest. And what was the intention around that? Yeah, as Kevin was saying, it was a chance for us to get together and, and celebrate what we're for, that there are alternatives out there. We can support green local business. Um, we can come together and learn more um, and just, just band together. It was a sense of community that we wanted to have with the Green Festival. Yeah, well, and with 40,000 people actually brings in a huge, huge community. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, amongst you know, looking back at the last 13 years since Screen Fest has been going on, I mean, what are some of the most significant changes that you have seen, Liz, with respect to how consumers have grown the green economy? Um, the the biggest change I've seen is the, the popularity of the word green. I mean, that word, now you see it everywhere, and that is good. I mean, it means that um, more consumers care about this or they think they should care about green or eco-friendly, um, but it also means that it's confusing to understand what exactly it means, and more and more c- corporations are, are wanting to go green as well, and that that can be good. It's a, it's a spectrum of commitment, I think, from different companies um, on, on how they're going green. Um, so I think it's mo- you know our economy is moving more in the right direction, but it's up to consumers to to do a little bit more research. Um, when they're choosing to buy a product, if they're looking for something that's more sustainable and really understand what those green claims mean. Yeah, and we'll definitely be getting into sort of the issue of greenwashing and how consumers can be much, much more aware um, a little bit later in the show. So Kevin Denneher of Global Exchange, I, I would love your take. I mean, you've been, you know, with, you've been promoting the green economy at Global Exchange for so long. I mean, what have you seen um, really change in the last 10 years with respect to this whole space of kind of Green well, consumers. If, you, if you look at the data, right, over the last 10 years, green jobs grew twice as fast as non-green jobs. And let's be clear, you know, if you're an accountant for a wind energy company, that's a green job. If you're a janitor for a solar energy company, that's a green job. Those are the jobs that are growing faster. Fast. It's, it's biofuels, renewable energy like solar and wind and tidal. The federal government energy department came out with a study that showed that one-third of all U.S. electricity could come from waves and tidal, and those are constant. They're always there. So you're seeing this massive shift, not just in people's consciousness and not just at the consumer level, but at the investing level, at the government level. Los Angeles is replacing their street lights with LED lights. They're going to save about $10 million a year in electricity. you got cities tapping the methane at their waste dumps to, to burn that, to to generate electricity, just all sorts of changes going on. San Francisco is at 80% resource recovery with a really rigorous uh, recycling and composting where, you know, we have a law that says everyone will separate your trash. And, you know, everybody needs to do that. But we got to remember that most of the waste in society is not from us as consumers. It's industry. It's corporations. It's forestry. It's industry. It's agriculture that's dominated by corporations. The corporations took over the food system. They took over the health care system. They took over the public airwaves, our airwaves. They don't pay us any rent. And now they took over the government. So it's up to us to take it back. And that's why we do this. We call it a party with a purpose. The Green Festival isn't just about, you know, people buying stuff. It's about educating people and getting them to organize and get a movement going. And I'm calling it the solutionary movement. And that would bring together the peace movement, the women's movement, the green movement, the climate change movement. If we all come together around the kind of world we want our aunt, our our future generations to live in, then we'll lay the foundation for a truly sustainable democratic society on this planet. Yeah, and actually, I mean, I think that walking into the Green Festival, one is probably overwhelmed by the amount of exhibitors and, you know, and 
basically stuff you can buy and, and things like that. But um, Liz O'Connell of Green America, there's also a whole bunch of kind of workshops and stuff in terms of organizing, in terms of, uh, you know, different sort of environmental education, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's several stages at the Green Festival. Uh, there's an entire food or stage um, dedicated to food, the good food stage. And all weekend long, they'll be talking about ways that you can um, change your diet to align with your values and also, you know, healthier choices, too. Um, on the, the main stage, Green Festival will have some talks about labor. I'll actually be leading two talks, one on Saturday about choosing more fair and sustainable clothing or apparel, and on Sunday about choosing more responsible electronics. Uh, there aren't a lot of choices right now for better electronics, but we are, you know, we're leading a corporate campaign right now called End Smartphone Sweatshops, and, you know, since there aren't choices, we need to make sure that there are choices in a few years, so we're seeing a lot of consumer interest in that campaign. Right, and uh, both of you, when you were talking about the, some of the big trends that have gone on in the field of sort of green economy, alternative economy in the last 10 years, you really talked about how the f- the fact that it's become much more mainstream. But then also some of the trends that we've seen maybe a little bit newer or getting a little bit more attention these days is stuff like the sharing economy. So, I mean, Kevin, can you talk a little bit about how what some of these new sort of disruptive sharing economic models, sharing-based economic models sort of fit in with uh, some of the broader work that maybe some of the bigger brands have done or or maybe some um, some of these smaller alternative companies, green companies? Yeah, sure. You know, the sharing economy and the green economy are basically the same thing because if you're sharing, you're not using as much resources. The, the corporate propaganda taught us to think as individuals and you need to have ownership of a vacuum cleaner even though you only use it like once a week or if you're me once a month. And now a website I want to hit people to that's really a cool new website. It's called Sharing X, like the letter X change so it's not ex it's just x sharing x change.com and it does for the sharing economy what kayak does for plane tickets you know where it searches all the different sites sharing exchange has all of these un- like dozens and dozens of you uh, you want a boat for the weekend but you don't want to buy one or rent it from some corporation there's a there's a website that will help you uh, connect with somebody who's got a boat. Liquid space for sharing offices. Get around for sharing cars. Airbnb. Look how successful Airbnb is. And yes, there's going to be bumps in the road. There's going to be fights between Uber and Airbnb around taxation issues and all that. Any new sector of an economy is going to have growth pains and it's going to bump up against government. And you know we got some stupid people in government who don't get the need for environmental sustainability. So, you know, that's just part of the struggle. But, I mean, if you look at where we were just like 15, 20 years ago and where we are now, the the, the system of change of the new system is getting stronger, but the old regime is still strong. So you have a situation of, in a sense, dual power, and people need to decide, look, you're going to buy a certain amount of shoes and socks and toilet paper and, you know, whatever. You can either buy it from big corporations who only have a single bottom line of profit, or you can buy it from a triple bottom line company that's balancing social justice, environmental restoration, and financial sustainability, which I think sounds better than profit. It's not... It's not enterprise that's the problem. It's corporate domination. Enterprise, global exchange, most of our revenue over the years has come from our stores, our tours, our book publishing, our events. The questions are, did you exploit people or nature in making the money? And then what do you do with the profits? Is it going into your, like, Rolls Royce collection or your mansion, or is it going back into the work? And most of us who work in the nonprofit world know what it's like to try and get by on really low salaries. I know, Michelle, you know about that. So, you know, this is part of the transformation. I would argue we're in the early stages of the first ever global revolution. All revolutions up until now were national, where the, the revolutionaries wanted to get control of the capital city to run that country differently. This is a global values revolution that is saying instead of subordinating people and nature to the economy, we subordinate the economy 
to people in nature. Instead of having money values rule over the life cycle, we have life values rule over the money cycle. Right. Oh, Liz O'Connell from Green America. Yeah, I just wanted to add one other great thing about the sharing economy is that you can save a lot of money, too, and know that the money you're spending is staying in your local economy rather than moving up the chain to some corporate you know, headquarters somewhere else. So uh, that's another great benefit. And to follow in on, um, in on that, Liz, how have you seen you know, the rise of these new you know, new sharing economy models um, work with challenge or coexist with some of, let's say, our traditional small green companies, these small mom and pop companies that um, I think form actually the bulk of a lot of the people that you see, um, for example, at Green Fest or that you might find in the Green America um, catalog. Yeah. You know, I haven't heard anything about, you know, a lot of competition between the sharing economy and the existing green economy. Um, I hear much more about like big corporations who don't like that the structure is getting changed, and especially in like hotels, for example. Um, there's been pushback in that sense. But I feel like the small green businesses I talk to, and we have many, like with thousands of green business members at Green America who are members, they see there is just growth ahead for them because there's more and more consumer interest in their products and, and the way that they do business. So I wouldn't even say they necessarily feel that they're in competition with one another because right now it's, it's a good time to be a committed small green business because the future is growing. Right. This is Tara Verde on 94.1 KPFA, KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno. I'm Michelle Chan, your host, and you've been listening to the voices of Kevin Danaher, co-founder of Global Exchange, and Liz O'Connell, Fair Labor Campaign's Director of Green America. So um, let's uh, get to um, this this sort of big question with respect to corporate greenwashing and how consumers can really be informed and essentially not have the wool pulled, pulled over their eyes. Um, because... As both of you mentioned, one of the biggest trends in the last 10 years is, in fact, that everybody wants to get on the green bandwagon somehow. And that means the door is open to greenwashing if you're not a careful consumer. Um, let's start with you, Liz. And what are some of the, the big things you think people ought to keep in mind? Um, some of the biggest things to keep, if, whenever you can support a local uh, small green business, that's probably your best bet. And you can know more about their values by visiting their websites or even calling them. They often, you know, just have one number you can call and get to a real person and ask them questions you want to know, like where their products come from or how they're made. They'll probably tell you. And if they don't, then you should ask more questions or maybe look somewhere else. Um, when it comes to, you know, uh, products from corporate companies, there's there's become a proliferation of labels on their products. And that can be helpful to sort of navigate how that product was made. Uh it's important as a consumer to know what those labels mean. So fair trade labels are, are a good one to look for. Uh, organic label means that the product was made without chemicals or pesticides. Uh, so knowing what those labels means, and if there's a new label you see that you don't know, you could look it up, go to the website, find out more. Um, it's also important not to be tricked by claims that they might make on their product, like natural or cage-free, because those are terms that are not actually defined by any third but like third party or government agency. Uh, so in that case, you, you would want to ask more questions and, and see what they mean by natural. Right. But even, I mean, you work, um, Liz, a lot in within the fair trade realm. And I, I can think of at least three or four different fair trade mm -hmm. labels. And uh, it's really actually difficult to know whether they're all equal or whether or not there are some that are more legit than others. Yeah, there are a lot of different labels now um, that work, you know, that define a product as fair trade or with better labor conditions. Uh, in fact, in the United States, now we have uh, Fair Trade USA's label, Fair Trade America, and the IMO Fair for Life uh, label. Those three labels, I'd say, all are very committed to uh, creating better working conditions for workers in other countries. Uh, there's also the label for Rainforest Alliance or a new one that's just entered the product um, in the U.S. that's called UTZ. U -T -Z. Um, both of those have labor standards, although uh, Rainforest Alliance has a stronger focus on um, environmental issues. Uh, so it's just they have different priorities as labels. Right. And Kevin Denneher of Global Exchange, what are some of the key tips that you give to your members and to others that are concerned about greenwashing? Well, you know, on this issue of labels, what's coming is the tech, it's already arrived actually, a technology where with your handheld device, you can scan the barcode of a product and you can get all sorts of information about the product and the company. Good Guide, which started right over in Berkeley, they've got over 10,000 products that they've done all the chemistry on. 
and it will either give you a red light, don't buy it, a amber light caution, or a green light, this is safe to buy. They've done all the background research. Indigenous Designs, a clothing maker up in Petaluma, they produce down in Guatemala, women's cooperatives making clothing. When you shoot the barcode of the product, you get a video interview with the woman who made that shirt or that pair of pants. So we're bringing together the rich world consumer and the poor world producer in ways that we couldn't do before. The Internet changes everything is what makes the sharing economy possible. So, you know, instead of people doing this thing of like, oh, it's all greenwashing, oh, you believe in green capitalism, you know, and, and it's really insulting, actually, for those of us who have sort of proven our anti-imperialist credentials. And what you got to do is you got to look at the positive side of someone cheating. If somebody cheats to win, because that's what greenwashing is, it's a company lying about the sustainability of their product. If you have to cheat to win, you didn't really win. And if they're cheating, if they're lying about their product, what they paid their workers, where it came from, they're eventually going to be exposed. So the way to look at this is it's actually good that there's multiple fair trade labels. The, the movement is so mature that we can have internal tactical debates about, hey, how are we going to expand fair trade to plantations? Shouldn't the plantation workers also be included in the fair? Oh, no, it's about small farmers. You know, that's a good debate to have. That's not a sign of weakness of our movement. That's a sign of the strength and maturity. We're going through sort of an adolescence into maturity of like, wow, we're so big. And we're moving so many billions of dollars that we can have multiple approaches to achieving the same goals. We don't need to question the integrity of people. Everybody want, everybody in this movement, broadly speaking, wants to have no starving children and no clear-cut forests and no wars for oil. It's a, it's a tactical debate about how do we get there. And we don't want to get into tactical sectarianism, you know, the groups that Oh, we write letters to Congress. You people who do street demonstrations in the street and get tear gas. That's tactical sectarianism. And just like the old ideological sectarianism of Stalinism, Leninism, Trotskyism, whatever, that just divides the movement. We need to unify. We need to come together. Big tent. Nobody left out and build a movement because what we're talking about is saving our species from self-destruction. That's the long-term goal. And when we put it in that bigger framework, it helps us subordinate some of these more silly uh, differences we have with each other. Liz O'Connell from uh, Green America. Tell us, I mean, give us your take as well on this idea of multiple approaches because one of the things that, you know, is an under current debate within the environmental community is this idea of dark green versus light mm -hmm, green and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know um, what happens when you get walmart going organic you know mm -hmm. that it, it creates a lot of a cognitive dissonance for people and i think that some of you know yeah. some of that is has got to be you know a raging debate amongst those of you that spend a lot of your time working within kind of creating the greener economy yes the debate is live and uh, alive and well but i was sitting here nodding my head with kevin because i so agree like if we're serious about being solutionaries we really have to figure out how we can work together and 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 move everyone along um i think it's a personal choice if you want to buy an organic product at walmart or if you only want to buy organic products at your farmer's market. And also it might depend for you on, on the day or if you're traveling, what you have access to. But uh, just being informed is important and, and, and figuring out what issues are most important to you. You can start there making changes there and gradually on time take on more uh you know, issues that, that you're concerned about, just introducing them one at a time so they don't feel totally overwhelmed. Right. Well, and I'm um, getting back for a second to this um, to this issue of labeling, because I know that um, stuff like the good, um, you know, the good guide and, and, and labels are what we indeed rely on, mm -hmm. you know, in order to um, make these informed choices. Um, I've seen on labels now um, something called B Corporation, which um, is it really gets to the point that Kevin raised about um, companies having a triple bottom line versus a, a, bottom, uh, a single bottom line, meaning environment, society, and the people, planet, profit. Is exactly. The definition I've so, heard. so tell us what is the B Corporation and, um, really, really quickly and whether or not. Yeah, yeah. What, what you can really glean from that. What it is. As far as I know, B Corporation is a new way to incorporate your business instead of like S Corp or LLC, in which you can be a mission-driven business where the mission of your business is in the charter of your company. So you 
aren't only accountable to the profits for your shareholders. Like the mission is at that same level of importance. Right. And so um, a B Corporation, I mean, Sinjevity, for example, is one of them that's really well known around here um, that installs solar panels. Um, so the B Corporation um, means label means that it's environment, paying attention to environment and social issues are ba- is baked into your corporate DNA and your bylaws and mm-hmm. such. Um, so as a labeling scheme, what does it, you know, what... What can a consumer take away from that? That is a label where it's uh, a reflection of the business itself, not a product label. Like a fair trade label means that this product is fair trade. It might not give you an indication of the entire business model. For example, you could buy fair trade coffee at Walmart. Uh, the B Corporation is a is you'll see it on products, but it's a reflection of the entire business operation that. That, again, like you said, that um, their mission is built into their charter. Right, right. Okay, well, we are already actually getting to the end of our show, and I really wanted to make sure that both of you, um, Kevin and Liz, had a chance to give out some websites and resources um, to our listeners. Um, So, Kevin from Global Exchange, why don't you go first? Yeah, sure. There's a few. New Rules, newrules.org is the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. They go around the country picking out all the best things. Obviously, uh, globalexchange.org, you know, that's my organization. I want you to check it out, greenfestivals.org. And people should uh, read the book Cradle to Cradle by William McDonough. It's a different model for an economy where there's no waste. Waste is a human concept that we need to get rid of. Every need, everything needs to be reused. Right. So, again, um, those websites were newrules.org, globalexchange.org, greenfestivals.org, and then um, Kevin also mentioned earlier The Good Guide um, and another book, uh, Cradle to Cradle by McDonough. So why don't we turn it over to you, Liz? Sure. I'll just throw in there greenamerica.org. That's the organization I work for, and Green America and Global Exchange are co-founders of the Green Festival. Uh, Green America and Global Exchange members get into the show this weekend for free, as well as Sierra Club members and people who have rode their bike to the festival. So I hope to see you all there this weekend. Definitely. And also wanted to um, let you know that because KPFA is a media uh, co-sponsor of the Green Festival, any KPFA listener can also get in for 50% off. So it's, if it's normally $15 a day, you can get in for only seven fifty. And all you have to do is go to greenfestivals.org to buy your ticket and enter in the promotion code KPFASF14. Again, you can get a half-price ticket by going to greenfestivals.org and buying your ticket with a promo code KPFASF14. That's all the time we have for today's show. Thank you so much, Kevin and Liz, for joining us, and to Erica Bridgman, our engineer. You can listen to archives of this show and others at kpfa.org, and we hope you have a great weekend. The Luna Dance Institute invites you to an evening of art and wine at Collector Art Shop in Berkeley. You can purchase art items, sip wine, and share appetizers while raising funds to bring dance to all children on Saturday, November 15th from 7 to 9 p.m. This is a benefit for the Luna Dance Institute. For more information, call 510-883-883. One 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 eight, or visit lunadanceinstitute.org. That phone number again is five one zero eight eight three one 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 eight.
are listening to 94.1 KPFA.